Hey, what's up, everybody? This is your boy, JD, and we're on another edition of CAP, Cultivate. Accumulate. And together we all will prosper. prosper. What's good with you, Erica? Whew, it has been a long, long week. It has been a hard week, and I'm so glad to be here today because, one, I woke up, so I made it in the land of the living. Oh, that's always a blessing. And... I'm excited today. Two cap podcasts in two weekends. I'm pretty cool. I'm pretty cool with that. Almost definitely, man. This is how we starting off the new year. The Lord has blessed us with 2024. So let's go ahead and get off into the buzz. The first buzz topic we have is uh, former NFL quarterback Tom Brady. This past week at the NFL Combine decided to run the 40 yard dash and he beat his time that he did as a rookie 24 years ago back in 2000. Now, Tom Brady's a year younger than me. He's 46. And when he was uh, trying out for the league uh, before he got drafted uh, by the Patriots back in 2000, he ran a 5-2-8, which is you know, considered slow, but he was quarterback. Well, this past week, he decided to recreate that and do it again. And at 46 years old, he ran the 40-yard dash in 5.18 seconds. Now, myself, I haven't ran the 40-yard dash in over 30-some <laughs> years. But my best 40-yard dash when I did play was a 4.45. So, 4.45. Four, yeah. Okay. So, what is your take on that? Wow. First of all, okay, you was fast back in the day, weren't you? I was a little bit. Uh huh. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Learn something new every day about my co-host. But um, I thought that this was very inspiring because to look at he's forty six. You know, we're in our forties, and of course, most um, you know, as you get older, you tend to get a little slower. You tend to get. You know, you're not as good as you were in your prime. Not as agile. Yeah, that's correct. Right. So to know that he's doing this, and it's 20, 20, really over 20 years later, and he's able to beat his own record. So that says a lot about him. That says a lot about the fact that he keeps right on going. He's building his stamina. He's having energy. And you can't keep on saying that us, us older folks can't, uh, can't get it done because he's showing we can yeah, it's mind over matter in, right. in, in most cases. Uh, but that that's something that, um, yeah, I have to, I got to give them thumbs up to Tom Brady on that. Uh, the next buzz topic is there's an abortion pill that is being rolled out at Walgreens and CBS uh, with all that's going on in the country pertaining to abortion restrictions and everything. And they're coming out with an abortion pill. So, one has to wonder, will this make people more reckless or will things stay the same, but they're rolling out with an abortion pill? What is your thought on that? Okay. Um, wow. First of all, um, I do recognize that when it comes to things like this, it's women's bodies. They, they're going to do whatever they want. We have freedom of choice. All of that. I do recognize that. I understand it. And that's the way, you know, it's supposed to be. You you need to think for yourself. However, me, myself, um, I can say I'm not for abortions um, for religious reasons and just my own personal take. I love children. I love people. And it's still a form of killing for me. So that's that's always a hard one for me. But in this world that we live in today, I'm kind of torn on how this is going to play out because they're just, you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about because you're still going to have, with this being in stores, you could also look at the sides of even protests because you know this is a very sensitive subject. It's a strong subject to people. And you never know what may transpire because of it. Yeah. Well, I don't per se have a dog in this fight. Other than what I do know is as a man, I 
to determine what a woman does with a body that's between her and God. Um, but we know we got people on both sides that say this, say that. Um, only way I, that I see things, you know, when there's extreme cases like of a violent rape or, you know, something terrible like incest. But, you know, you have some people who this is their form of birth control. They reckless when they're engaging. That's a little different, but you know everyone's gonna have their opinion on it. But uh, now that with all the restrictions with these southern states with abortion, I was just surprised that this is coming out. Uh, you know, cause they already have what they call the Plan B pill at uh, Plan B at the stores, but this is something different. So I can say uh, a whole lot about that too. But we're gonna go on. To okay, this. <laughs> so. Uh, the next buzz topic, the final one. It is Women's Month, so shout out to all the ladies. Shout out to you and and all the the uh, the beautiful women out here that are doing things, amazing things. So we're gonna uh, shout out someone who has had a profound effect on pop culture here the past few years, and she also came to Memphis. Yes. That is Miss Tabitha Brown, who is uh, who has made becoming vegan very popular. Mm -hmm. Um. So what is your take on that? Because she is, she does, she does quite a bit. First, let me say um, kudos, shouts out to Tabitha Brown. She has won her first award. Um, she has a new book out, The uh, I Did a New Thing. The title just grabs you, so I can't wait to read it myself. Tabitha Brown is got her start as a YouTube influencer. I mean, she is someone that I really look up to just for that right there. Because as you know, I just started my um, new YouTube show, um, Manifest Mondays. Right. And so I'm like really paying attention to her. She has a podcast with her husband, Chance. She has multiple books out, multiple vegan items and hair, hair, uh, hair products in Target. So right. she is a wonderful woman to highlight this Women's Month and she is doing great things. I actually had the opportunity to take a picture with her when she was in Memphis. So oh, that's dope. That's pretty cool. And this has been enlightening. So kudos to Tabitha Brown um, as we kick off this Women's Month of March 2024. You know, I thought about us highlighting me and everything, but you know, I didn't want to. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to bore y'all or anything, but you know, we could have highlighted me too. You know what I mean? Well, it's the, March is, is just the beginning. Today is the, this, what, the second day. So, you know, we get to it, but, and now we get into who our guest is today. So Erica. Wow. Y'all, I am excited. Y'all just don't know how excited I am. This guest is an amazing guest. I first got a chance to meet him in like 2013 when I got a group of kids from um, my church and from this Youth Center Leadership Empowerment Center to go to this uh, bicycle drive during Christmas. They were giving away bikes and reading um, to the children. It was an amazing event that he um, hosted, sponsored, put together everything he is a native of las vegas nevada he is a former national basketball association player he is an active participant participant in the community dynamic speaker 40 years of coaching experience selected six overall in the 1975 nba draft won nba championship in 77 with portland trailblazers and he is the former head coach of the Memphis Grizzlies. Our guest today is none other than Coach Lionel Holland. That's what's up. Well, thank you. We are so, so <laughs> glad to have you. So other than everything that I have just said about you, and that is remarkable to say the least, tell us a little bit about Lionel Hollins. Wow, first of all, I came up with the idea for Bike Buddies and the charity and all that we uh, did and with the mentor dinners and uh, uh, backpacks and sending kids uh, to school with supplies and also, you know, getting haircuts, getting teeth screenings and all the things that sometimes the underserved doesn't have opportunity for. 
but I had a lot of help. We talk about cultivate. I had a lot of people that cultivated my initial seed yeah. <laughs> and brought it to fruition. And, uh, you know, obviously because of who I was, my name got to be at the forefront, but there were a lot of people that helped and I, I'm grateful for that. And, uh, uh, one of my special people is Karina Polk who lives in Houston, who would come up here and develop, uh, the, the partnerships and get people to volunteer and do all the things that we needed to get things done. So I'll shout out to her and then my wife and my kids and, uh, and all that they contributed to it as well. But uh, I'm just a, a, a regular person who, uh, you know, has been blessed beyond measure, uh, you know, coming from a very impoverished environment. So I can relate to the underserved kids today. Uh, also, uh, I can relate to the underdogs. You know, my grandmother was a domestic. She cleaned homes. She cooked. She bathed other people's kids while we were at home doing our own thing. Wow. We had to do it for us with her orders. And we had to do it <laughs> right. It wasn't like it was not accountability, but, uh, you know. So uh, when I go on the road, I leave tips for maids in the room. Sometimes I'll see someone uh, serving us and you could tell that they have an issue or had an issue or they're not as spry and you want to bless them and help them because you never know. Right. And uh, I, you know, I try to impart that to the players that it's not just us, that what we have is for other people. So right. that that's, you know, I'm a lot, I'm, I'm complex. You know, I need my daughter to tell me exactly who I am because she thinks she knows <laughs> anything about me. But, you know, so, uh, and my wife too. They, they do. I mean, I've been with my wife 45 years. So uh, that's amazing. You know, by uh, the grace of God, we're still together. And a, <laughs> Absolutely. And a, and a pastor told us just recently, he says, God been in your stuff for a long time. I said, yeah. And it wasn't always just stuff. It was mess as well as stuff. So uh, we've been blessed. Okay. That's beautiful though. 45 years able to show us how it's done. <laughs> we can learn a lot from you guys. And I've met your wife. She's an absolutely beautiful person inside and out. Thank you. Well, Coach Hollins, I want to, we want to get right into this. So what I wanted to ask you was what was the experience like being drafted in the first round of the 1975 NBA draft? Well, let me fast forward and say that I would like to be drafted in today's NBA draft. <laughs> First of all, I heard my name called on the radio. Oh, we were not in New York City. We didn't have new suits made for us. And there was not the commissioner shaking our hand and welcoming us to the mm. NBA. But uh, a reporter called me and asked me, I, I had an idea that I was going to be drafted, but I didn't know where. And uh, I was in a Y playing an all-star game. And I bumped my knee on the floor, and a guy comes in the training room, which would never happen today in college or pros, mm. that's not with the team. And he says, hi, I'm so-and-so. And I said, doc, I thought he was a doctor. I said, I banged my knee. He said, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to see your knee. He said, I'm here to tell you we have an interest in you. And it was the Portland Trailblazers wow. player personnel director. So I had an idea, but when it happened, being the first guard – and the number six pick in the draft, you know, we can speculate on money all we want, but you know, <laughs> I made enough money in that in that time. But today, wow. But it was exciting. It was unexpected. I wasn't even trying to be an NBA player. I just played because that's what I did. I played football, baseball, basketball, ran track all the way up into high school. I wasn't even going to college. So I was going to just get a job, mm -hmm. buy myself a van, live in it, work at the hotels, eat twice a day at the hotel that I worked at, and save all my money so I could get out of the environment that I was in. That was my goal. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then my high school coach directed me to this junior college, and I tell everybody, it was a tough experience, but every wilderness experience uh, produces growth. Yeah. And I learned a lot there. And I always say I wouldn't be here with you guys talking if I hadn't been in that environment because I learned how to relate to 
all types of people. Mm -hmm. I learned how to not be as bitter and angry about my circumstances. And also, I learned how to stop fighting all the time. <laughs> you know? you know? Oh, I mean, I had to fight. But being in that environment, it was a white black thing for me. Mm -hmm. If a white yeah. person didn't pass me the ball, I wanted to fight them. And they were all white. So, you know, every time <laughs> I felt like I was being uh, misused or mistreated, and coach used to throw me out of practice. He threw me out every day for a week. And he told me, you can't fight everybody, you know. And so uh, going back to the original part of your question, I was happy, but it wasn't the same excitement that's been generated where you're going around and visiting teams and working out for teams and people are process, whining and dining you. The process was different back oh, then. Totally yeah. different. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so you've had an amazing um, journey in sports. Can you tell us how your journey started? Well, I started, I think I was fourth grade. Wow. And I started playing baseball. <laughs> and my uncle was one of the coaches. I was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that. That's my line when I don't think somebody can play. I say, he's terrible. You know, and I was terrible. <laughs> I, uh, I went to the park and... I either struck out or I walked. There was no in between because I never took the bat off my shoulders. <laughs> struck out or walk. Struck okay. out or walk. And my uncle, I swing, swing. And I would freeze. I would freeze. And then I'd go out in the field. And every time the ball was hit to me, it went between my legs. But I had no idea how to play. And then I'd throw off my cap, turn around and sprint up, go get the ball and throw it back in. So that was my first experience playing. But ultimately, I became a really good baseball player, and uh, baseball was my sport. But as I grew, basketball became the sport. Football was always an interest of mine, but, you know, <laughs> I started out with Pop Warner, and I weighed 73 pounds. They told me, you got to come back next year. <laughs> you don't weigh it enough, right? <laughs> yeah. So I did come back, and I kept playing. And I just enjoyed playing. I enjoyed all sports, golf, hockey. Whatever it was, I watched on TV, whatever was on TV. So that's how my journey got started. And that's where the uh, mentorship of men, because I was raised with my grandmother, my mother, two sisters, and two aunts. You notice I didn't say a man. There was yeah. not a man around. And so my influence with, was them. But what I got from my coaches was the discipline and the training of how to be a man, how to do manly yeah. things. And so I'm a firm believer that there's a man that's needed in the house, but if there isn't, and you're playing sports, that's the responsibility of coaches. That's true. That is definitely, I, when I worked in the school system um, before and I was a coach, there was a lot of young men uh, who didn't have their fathers or, any other positive role, male moral models in the home. So they would look up to Coach Davis. And, uh, you know, I gladly accepted that um, when I realized, okay, this is what this is. So uh, so that's definitely um, something that's commendable and that coaches do play a role besides the sport that they're coaching in a young man's lives. Uh, you know, you know. It, it, the, the game and the winning and the losing – Fades away. I got an attic full of trophies. Plaques mean nothing. But the lessons that were imparted to me by my coaches that have helped me be consistent and I won't say just consistent, but also successful because they put me on the path and the direction that I needed to go and the things that I needed to stay away from and how to be uh, somebody that could uh, make an impact and, and leave a real legacy besides scoring points and winning games. Yeah. Being a woman and hearing both of you all talk about this, especially the importance of a man in your life, that's very inspiring to actually sit here and listen to that. And it actually makes me think of your book, Five Dimensions of a Man, as well. Yep. Yep. So what I wanted to ask you um, was, what was it like 
to win the NBA championship with the Trailblazers in 1977 because, and not to make you feel old or anything, that was the year after I was born. So I was one years old, and I know that's the only championship they won because I just remember Portland playing against, you know, my Bulls in the 90s, you know, when they became, I guess, other than that championship that right, you all won. Right, right. Yeah. Well, uh, it was the ultimate to win it, and it was exciting, and we partied all summer <laughs> because of my friend, Maurice Lucas, you know, we started this program when we were going around to the inner city schools and doing camps three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We went to a different school every day. In the Portland area? In the Portland area. And so we started out one school, you know, we got 200 kids. Then we got 300 at the next school. And by the end of the summer, everybody from every school that we started at were yeah. at the last school. We were having to do the camp outside on the playground. We couldn't just use the gym because there was so many people. And we had a great time. And, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing about it, it goes back to I have a bond with every one of those guys. And I think there's both coaches have passed and three players have passed, and my best friend, Maurice Lucas. But I still go up to Portland and, and get involved in his uh, foundation with his son. And I have players, teammates, that we don't talk all the time because everybody's got their life and we live every, everywhere. But when we talk, it's like we just talked yesterday. We pick up and we pick up on each other. And uh, so the, the, the sacrifices that you have to make, the uh, commitments that you have to make. And I go to the, to, to the, the level of vulnerability. See, we don't think about vulnerability, but in going for a championship, there's so many ups and downs. There's so many times when you might want to give up, but your teammate grabs you by your jersey, grabs you by your arm and says, we need you. You can do this. Mm -hmm. And there's times when you do it for them. And so you're going all through this. They know your biggest fears, right? They know your strengths. They know your, your weaknesses and you know theirs. And so it just becomes this bond that is lifelong. It can't be broken. And uh, that's the greatest thing that I got from that. I still talk to Bill Walton. Yeah, I was about to ask he, you how was Bill Walton as a teammate? He, Bill was a great teammate. He worked hard, and he uh, didn't allow anybody else not to work hard. Between he and Maurice Lucas, they were the leaders of the team, the, the genuine uh, call leaders. We all were leaders. We had a team of tough-minded Mm -hmm. uh, very competitive people, very smart people. And that's why we were the youngest team to ever win the NBA championship. Oh, see, that's something I didn't know. You, you we know started you? Bill and Luke. They were 24. Uh, Bobby Gross and myself were 23, and Johnny Davis was 21. Wow. And we had some couple of veteran guys on our team that weren't starting during the finals. But it, it's not about age. It's about maturity. It's about what? Are you willing to give up? What are you willing to be committed to? And for how long are you willing to be committed to it? Because it's a journey. And it doesn't just happen. You win four in a row. You may lose four in a row. You may, are you going to stay together? Are you going to lift yeah. each other up? Are you going to battle for that other person when they're having a bad game and they need to pick me up, not just by a pat on the back, but you got to go play and bring yeah. it so we can win the game that night. And so all those things are involved in the coaching and, uh, you know, just I, I could write a book on just <laughs> what it takes to to win a championship. Yeah. Wow. It's not what everybody says. You can't just put the 12 best players on a team and expect to win. It's got to be a cohesiveness. It's got to be a, a, a chemistry and a yeah. synergy mm -hmm. that just grows and it, and it becomes a bond. Like, you know, when you put that uh, glue on it won't let go, you know, yeah. you can pick up a boat or something, you know, it, yeah. it, it's that kind. Cause sometimes synergy is fragile. That's true. And it, you know, things go bad. Somebody complains about no plan time, but it, you have to realize your role and embrace it. Right. And it ain't always what you want, but you learn that that's the way life is too. You go to a job and you apply for this. They say, we don't have that job, but we have this job. If you want it, you can have it. 
but you can't have that job. Well, are you going to take it? And if you take it, are you going to embrace the fact that you have a job? Or are you going to complain that you didn't get the other role? Yeah. So it, it's, it's, but it was great. I mean, the city went bananas. You, we had a parade. People were, it was like New York City. People were in the office buildings as we went down the street waving and throwing papers and stuff. I had a car full of flowers and cards that, you know, obviously they got left in the car when I when, when I got out of it. They didn't know that, but you know, they they were yeah. they were for us. And then the <laughs> camp, all of that stuff, and and we became icons. Every time I go there, everybody remembers that. Just like you said, you were only a year old. There's people that weren't born, but their parents have shared pictures and mm-hmm. books about that that event that had an impact on their life. So that that's really the best best part about when you, you look back on it, the bonding and the lifelong friendships and then the legacy that we left just by our performance. I always tell people, uh, people are entertained by the excellence of your performance. Yeah. It's not yeah. like you go to a concert, you want to hear the, the saxophone player play what he can play to the best of his ability. You don't want to hear somebody over here jumping in the way, right? Mm -hmm. His role is be over here. But in the end, and it's kind of what I see a little bit today, and I I digress. People want to go out and put on a show like the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, doing something fancy. But the game is about five people in sequence synchronized together, operating, thinking like each other, and performing on a level that makes people excited. Executing the plays to win. Yeah. (laughs) A huge legacy it is. Um, I wanted to ask you, as an NBA legend and public figure, what has been your greatest contribution to the community? And you have had many. Wow. Just being in it. Is a great contribution mm. doing something. Yeah. When we were in Portland, we did something that we didn't know what it was going to be, and it turned out to be amazing. Coming here as an assistant coach, waking up one morning, and it was put on my heart, you need to start a foundation. You need to do something. I didn't know exactly what it was, and then ideas start coming to my head, and then just doing it. Yeah. There's a lot of needs in a lot of areas, but... The mentality tends to, tends to be, I'll join if somebody else do it, does it, you know. But the reality is, is that if you do it, they'll join you, and it'll be bigger than you ever anticipated being. And that's just being in it, just doing. You know, I've been in a lot of different communities and done a lot of stuff, and it's just a joy to see the young kids, you know, uh, just be excited about opportunities because there's a lot of uh, – depression. There's a lot of, uh, you know, going without meals, going without clothes, going without just the necessities. And when you can give people hope, Mm -hmm. there's a chance because when there's hopelessness, then the crime, then the murders of of a little things, because the, well, what does it matter? I'm going to jail. I don't have nothing out here. So I go to jail it don't matter. But when you start showing them that there's a there's a positive path that you can take, but you got to choose to take it, that's important. I would definitely agree with you with that. Um, actually, both of us have had so many um, dealings with the kids and with mentoring and even both um, did a youth leadership coaching program that I started. And just being out there in it and watching the kids grow Mm-hmm. watching them go from their mentality of thinking and growing from that, growing from just being a product of their environment, being able to see that you can do so much more. Yes, this is where I am right now, but it doesn't have to be where you stay. Well, you know, I, I believe that, you know, when you care and they see that you care, they will let you discipline them. Mm-hmm. They will let you hold them accountable. And it's mm-hmm. the same way with a team. People say, well, how can you yell at your guys and do this? Because they know I care about them. It's not about me. It's about them. And once you develop that relationship, it's just like your parents. You let your parents yell at you. 
<laughs> right? True. Because you know they care. If you didn't know that, you would rebel all the time. And it's the same way with these young kids. When they see that you put an arm around and you want them to have something, then they start wanting to change. They want to please you. They want to do something that makes you happy right? by what they've done. And I think that that's important when we, when, when we go into the communities because, you know, love is huge and hope is huge, you know, and trust is huge. When you give hope through love, you get trust. And it's it's funny that that you mentioned that because that's a good segue to my next question. You have coached the Brooklyn Nets, and of course, no one can forget you coached the Memphis Grizzlies here. Um, so, how would you coach Hollins if you was the coach right now? Coach the Grizzlies with young stars like John Morant, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson. Well, I don't like to answer that question because. Taylor Jenkins has done a good job. And uh, I don't want people to think that I think he hasn't done a good job. Oh, yeah. yeah this I, is, I know, yeah, but I mean, yeah. that's why I get asked that question all the time. Okay. But I, I would just be me, but my first question would be, what do you want your legacy to be? And not just basketball, but throughout because once basketball is over, a lot of us lost our rel relativity. <laughs> We're not relative at all. We're most of it. We, I can go back to some of the greatest players that have played and nobody even knows about them. Nobody talks about them. Nobody even knows where they are. Now there's those ones that are still pertinent, but just that. And what do you think about when negative things get said about you. Mm -hmm. And how would you go about changing that? What is important to you? Because once you find out what's important to, to people, then you can start working with them. But if you don't know what, what they want, how can you help somebody if you don't know what they want? And if there's already this entitlement and feeling that they're above the law, I think those are situations that I would 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 address. You got to have communication on a regular basis. One of my favorite players, and not because of his talent on the court, but the relationship that we developed in the years that we were together, Zach Randolph. Zach wanted nothing to do with me when he got here. And I can understand that he didn't trust anybody but himself. And... Hmm. I used to tell him, I said, my door is open. Come talk to me whenever you want. He wouldn't. And I told him before that, I said, when I have a problem with you, I'm coming to you. So if you have a problem with me, <laughs> please come to me because I'm definitely coming to you. <laughs> and over time, one of my, one moment was like, he was like, coach, coach, I'm thinking about getting married. I was like, really? <laughs> 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 and he started talking about a ring. I said, man, if you got a ring from a Cracker Jack box, your girl would want that. I said, you don't understand. You know, you, you're looking at it from you got to get this big ring and you got to do all these special things. That doesn't make your relationship. Right. And, uh, you know, so th just, just developing that relationship with him and the players that we had. And, you know, I still talk to Tony Allen, see him. We go to lunch periodically. You know, I send him devotions. Yeah, because you had some heavy hitters on. That was the the era of the grit and grind. You know, Zebo, Tony Allen, Mike Conley. Um, you know, so they they, and they they were tough individuals, but that's how they survived and got to where they were. Mm -hmm. And I have to recognize this because that's how I survived and got to where I was. Right. And uh, everybody doesn't have the little things that they don't have to fight for and they have to have something else. But these kids had to have something that was deeper than anybody else. And they survived and they made it and they have lives now that they can leave a legacy for their kids, for their wife, for the rest of their family. And it's a hard thing to, and 
in part to kids because they only see money, fun, and now. And then they can't even see behind them to say, oh, I appreciate your knowledge because they're going to tell you, man, that was then. It's a new day. This is a new time until the first time they stumble and you bring up your experience and place it where their experience is. Then they can see that things don't change over time. It's the same world today as it was. There's new technology. There's electric cars and, you know, there's no more <laughs> horse and buggies, you know, in, in mainstream. But uh, so I don't know. I, mean, I just get excited when I think about imparting knowledge and being a mentor. And it's a great thing to be excited about. Kudos to even what you've done thus far. And I'm saying thus far because there's always, <laughs> always more to do. I'm, I'm forever a suit and I always say Before that. Before you move on, I got to get excited because uh, I like that you said that, you know, I think about as I turn 70, I'm like, dang, I'm old and, you know, I only have so much life left, right? What am I going to do? And by, I'm too old. That's what I, and then when you read the Bible and it says Abraham was 75 when he left home. Moses was 80 when he went to get the Israelites out of Egypt. He uses whomever he chooses to use it at whatever stage of your life. He yeah. used David as a young man, but he used Moses as an old man. So time and age means nothing to God. And when you think about it like that, you can get excited again about what he has planned for me in the future. It's a beautiful age, too. My mom will be celebrating her 70th birthday in two weeks. Well, two weeks. Happy birthday to her. <laughs> She's excited, too. Big party and everything. You made a quote at a Heal the Hood event. And actually, we actually talked about it a little bit this morning. Your current circumstances do not determine your future destiny. Elaborate on that for us. Well, there's there's parts to that. One, we're all born where we are with the parents that we have or the parents that we don't have. The money we have or the money we don't have, the neighborhood, the friends that are around us, we're born with that. And no matter how much money you have, how much status and power you have, you can't go back and change that. But you can, going forward, change the story and make it right. And when, through the help of God, you will make it right because he will take you to the destiny that has always, already been preordained before you were even put in your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. The gifts that you were given, the personality that you had, he already had in mind before he knit you in your mother's womb. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, right, you forget about the past in terms of, you don't stay in it. You can talk about it sometimes and you can share it with people for hope and inspiration. But the reality is where you're going is more important than where you come from. Exactly. Yeah. That is, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, uh, some good wisdom you just imparted right there because that's true. Um, of course, you know, being a guest here on the show, the acronym is CAP, Cultivate, Accumulate, Prosper. So my question is, how did you cultivate your gift of coaching to do what it is that you've done over the years? <laughs> oh, man. I used to read books. I, I have a lot of books from coaches that I admired, coaches that I didn't even know. I learned drills from reading books, going to clinics. You know, I went to a John Wooden clinic and I was expecting all this great stuff. He just gave his pillars of life, right? Mm. You know, how to be as a person and, and cultivating being me, regardless of the circumstances. Tony Dungy gave me the greatest advice and he was in town and somebody from the organization that he was speaking at brought him over to meet me in, 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 our, in the arena. And I was telling him about some issues that I was having with the owner. And the owner's stubborn, good man, he was stubborn, as I was. 
And so he says, when I was coaching, he said, Chuck Noll told me, stubborn is a virtue, hmm. but only if you're right. <laughs> he said, if you believe you're right, be stubborn. And, and I, I've, I've lived with that because it is true. I've had people say, how can you say that to that person with the power that they have over you? I said, because I'm only telling the truth. And if they want to fire me for telling the truth, I need to be in a different situation anyway. And I tell young coaches, quit worrying about your job. Just do your job to the best of your ability. Somebody is watching. Kids, somebody's watching. When, when I go and, and, and scout when I'm in college, I don't go to see you play. I go to see how you interact with the coaches, the other players, the fans, everybody, because that's going to determine how much interest I have in you because there's going to be other players that play similar. There are, you know, the generational players that come along that are above everybody, but most players are on the same play. Yeah. And the reason they rise is because of who they are in character and integrity and their care factor. So that's how I did it. And, you know, when I got opportunities, I was able to experiment. I, I was in the minor leagues a couple of times. I got to do what I want how I wanted. And then if they didn't like it, I sent them home. And that's harsh, but that's reality. Yeah. I'd be like, you can't stand here and curse me out and disrespect me and still be on my team. And I didn't have to let them. But there was a time when I got to the NBA in coaching that I still had to manage that person. But again, when you build relationships, you don't usually have those issues. Okay. So with the... <laughs> That was the cultivate, never get the accumulate question. Um, what have you accumulated along this journey? And so many people, you know, sometimes they even say it's not always about the money, of course. So, so much more you can accumulate. Well, the first thing that come to mind for me is the experiences. Mm. And I feel like uh, my man on the lifestyle of rich and famous, living a champagne life with a <laughs> beer budget. I had to throw that out there. Right? <laughs> uh, I've been around the world for free. Mm. I've been to multiple countries. I've done clinics and camps and coach players in multiple countries. And so the people I've met, I have a friend in Mali. We don't even speak the same language, but he sends stuff. And I, I send stuff to him so I know what he's doing because he's doing what I'm doing. He's trying to find out how to translate stuff mm -hmm. so we can communicate. And uh, I have friends in China, you know, friends in England, Germany, wow. Italy, all over the world. So those experiences and the people that were brought into my life to add to my life is, is very important. You know, I was able to, I can't walk past this because I was able to put my kids to college and we've been blessed from when I was making $30,000 and we'd go on vacation every summer. People would say, Hey, you want to stay at our house for a week? So I was, I've been blessed. So that, 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 that you know, so all these things are, are the things that I remember the people that have come in and did something for me and they didn't have to, I wasn't asking, but I was thankful. And it's all because I got favor from man by God. You know, we, we forget that, you know, sometimes it's not what you know and what you can do is who, who God gives you favor with. And uh, I've been highly favored. Great. Now for the last cap question, <laughs> <laughs> what has been most prosperous about your journey? <laughs> it's right it's right there. I'm trying to formulate how to say it because uh, it has to be the marriage mm. because there's been a lot of ups and downs. There's been a lot of maybe you need to go your way, <laughs> right? Mm. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. You don't even know what you want type stuff. And then and, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the pain that I've caused, 
in those situations and being stupid and being of the world. But we always had that ribbon in the sky that God was attached to another end. It was attached to us. I always say it might have got shredded down to like the last few threads, <laughs> but God didn't let it come apart. Wow. And then he also kicked me in the butt, probably her too, but more me, and made everything prosper the way it was planned to be. That's beautiful. That's what's up. That's absolutely beautiful. Well, Coach Hollins, we're now in the segment of our show where we're going to have a little fun. So this segment is called Top 5. And my top five that I'm going to ask you, and then I'll give you my take is, what is, what is your top five NBA championship teams of any era, just your top five? In no particular order, but just your top five. Well, I'll have to go with the Bulls. I was a even when I was assistant coach, I was a Bulls fan. That's crazy, right? That's my, that's, <laughs> yeah, I, that's my guy. <laughs> but until we, when I was with Phoenix, we played them in the finals. I wasn't a fan of them. Then. <laughs> yeah, I, <I'm>... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, that Bulls team, I'd have to say, uh, uh, the team that not most of you know about was the Celtics when Bill Russell became a coach after he retired and they won the championship. That was a favorite of mine because they were, I think. Most of the series went at least six games, but I think went seven games because they were at the end of their run. Yeah. And they still reached down inside. And I would say the same with the Warriors' most recent championship because their run as a group, they may have another run as they change the team, but their run as it was is over. And they reach down and pull out something that we talked about earlier, that bond, that chemistry, that, you know, we know how to do this and we're going to do it together yeah. regardless. And, you know, the, the Laker uh, team in 1972 that won 33 straight games and then went on and won the championship. I was a huge Laker fan as a kid, huge Boston fan, huge Walt Frazier fan, mm -hmm. huge Oscar Roberts. I mean, I, 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 and then as I got older, I started liking coaches. And everybody asked me, why do you root for Bill Belichick? Why do you root for Nick Saban? They have this, that. I said, you don't understand. Winning is hard. And they do it consistently. Mm -hmm. There's something to be applauded for that because winning once, a lot of people can do. Winning twice, some people can do. But winning six, seven championships in, 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 your, in your career, wow. is, it takes something that I want to know what you have so I can impart it to myself. And, and so that that and then obviously our championship okay. in seventy seven, you know that might be over five, but I put that at the top of this because I was on it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, okay. Well, I'm I'm gonna give you my top five. Of course, you know I, I was always a Michael Jordan and Chicago fan. That's that's my birth city. So the nineties Bulls, both sets, the mm -hmm. both of the three peaks, uh, the the two thousand. In 2001, 2002, Lakers, because I'm a huge Kobe fan, Shaq and Kobe. The 87, 88 Lakers with Magic, Kareem, and Worthy. Um, that little stint when I was coming out of high school in 95, but that 94, 95 Rockets team, because I like Akeem Olajuwon. I mean, the dream was he was, a, he was a bad boy at center. And then lastly, the 2012 and 2013 Miami Heat with LeBron and D-Wade, um, you know, they, I know people call them the Heatles, but <laughs> they went to four straight. They won two out of the four. They actually could have won probably three that first year, but they just ran up against the Dallas Maverick team that ended up pulling pulling out uh, the stops. But uh, that team, you know, they, LeBron and D Wade were to me at at during that time like a. Another verse, another version of what Mike and Pippen was mm -hmm. during that run that they had. But uh, so that, those are my top yeah, five that, teams. You see, I have to bone to pick with you on that one because uh, <laughs> you thought about it and wrote it down. I had to <laughs> think about it in my head, and you know, I was I was going through the different eras, right? Yeah. 
And I forgot one, our 2020 championship in L.A. I was on the Lakers. I was assistant coach with the Lakers in the well, bubble. Okay. And I like that one simply because nobody said that it could be done with all the bit pieces that we had bought together. They didn't see it being able to mesh. Yeah. And LeBron with his greatness. Thinking about LeBron in Miami, they could have lost all four of those championships. The one that they beat San Antonio on and they didn't get to rebound. They took yeah. – San Antonio took the big man out of the game and – they got the offensive rebound, and Ray Allen hit the three to tie it up. I mean, and you can yeah. say that about all of them. I'm not trying oh, to of course. disparage, but I love LeBron. I love Kobe. I love Shaq, Charles Barkley. I got it. I play with Elijah Wan. I coach Barkley. I mean, these guys have have something that is a, a cut above everybody else. Michael, give you a story real quick. Go interview for the Charlotte Hornets job. I'm sitting there. Michael has all my information, my bio, my coaching plan, and he's going through it. He says, you were playing in 84 when I came in the league? I said, yeah. He said, I probably tore you a new butthole. <laughs> 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 and that was Michael, right? And like Larry Bird. All those guys have special qualities, man. Well, so listen, I'm sitting here listening to both of y'all. I'm sitting here seeing my producer nodding his head. <laughs> Y'all talking all the sports. I might not know a whole lot about sports, but at least I can name a couple of teams, and I can definitely say Bulls, Lakers, Grizzlies. All right. That's what I got. I got three. I got three for y'all. See, when pe people come up to me all the time and they say, you know, I don't know anything about basketball, but I've heard about you. It don't matter. Because when I go out and give speeches, I always say, most of you know me as the Memphis Grizzlies former coach. But when I get done, I hope you are here and want to come back because of the other person. Right. And I can actually say that in the past couple of years, I've gotten to understand the game a whole lot more. I understand basketball more than I understand football. And I actually enjoy it, especially the fact that I'm actually able to follow it. So... <laughs> That makes it a whole lot better. But uh, <laughs> I am a woman. I might be kind of slim, gained a little bit of weight, but I love to eat. I love to eat. So we're going to go with the top five fine dining restaurants. I'll let you start, then I'll give my five. Do they have to be in Memphis? No. There's a uh, seafood place in Chicago. They have a tower where they have crab legs. They have uh, oysters, and mm. and, it, and it, it, it's shaped like a pyramid, right? <laughs> and you come in there, and you just yeah. eat, and then they say, what do you want to eat now? You know, they ate all the tower, <laughs> and they ask you, what do you want to eat? Uh, that I don't know the name of I don't remember names of restaurants. Uh, and I'm better at walking up on a restaurant and looking in and say, I think we need to go in there. Right, without ever yeah. having been there, and it winds up being good. But I like to eat, and I like, I can tell you about food. Give me some Italian food, some spaghetti. <laughs> right? uh -huh. Give me some Chinese food. Give me some savory, you know, steak and gravy. <laughs> you know, <all laughs> oh, yeah. It. You know, I, oh, yeah. I can eat. Uh, and my wife, uh, she doesn't let me eat eat that kind of stuff most of the time. So uh, <laughs> that's okay. It's good for my health. And as she says, I'm your helpmate. So, uh -huh. so uh, you know, there was a restaurant in Houston called the Liberty Kitchen. Mm. You know, there's a place in Las Vegas called Michael's. Mm. It's at the South Close Plaza. They have the best flounder and sea bass. I saw that place when I was in Vegas. I didn't go to eat there, but I did see it um, when I ventured, you know, I was on the strip, but then later on kind of took a little bus to go into um, the little area. I can't think of the name of the area that's away from the strip that's sort of equivalent to like Bill Street. Are you uh, talking about Fremont Street? Fremont, yeah. Yeah, I took the I took a little bus when I left from, because most of my time was there on the strip because my hotel was on the strip. Mm -hmm. 
But I, I I remember seeing that place, Michaels. Michaels, yeah. is, and it, it's it's a throwback. You walk in, and it's not very big. The waiters are all in tuxedos, and they take care of you like you are the king or the president or somebody. Mm. The service is incredible, but the food is even more incredible. I need to try that out the next time I go to Vegas. South Coast Plaza is just south of the Strip. They have, they do have one on the other side where he was talking about, yeah. but the one out there is not as busy. And uh, mm. make sure you don't leave home without it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to try that one out. I'm talking about your American Express. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 some, MX, I knew I that. Know, one. Some people out here might not get that, right? <laughs> I, I knew exactly one. when you said that. I was don't like, leave okay. home with that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, because that's when you can like really make sure you get a give a couple of shout outs to Memphis. Uh, the Hen House. Mm -hmm. Okay. The new place in Germantown. Lime local, a local lime. Okay. I've seen it. I haven't been there yet. I hear this guy well, good you Mexican gotta, food. You got to go over there about three thirty to make sure you get in. Oh, by five okay. o'clock, there's a line outside. Ever since it's been open. Yes, authentic Mexican food. Yeah, yeah. I love Mexican. Yeah, and uh, they have uh, just it's great food. Oh my God, I gotta try it. Yeah. See now, I'm uh, getting excited. Barbecue. I'm still interstate on Third Street. <laughs> you know, everybody <laughs> talks about all these other different places. I still like that place, and uh, but we eat from wherever. And my granddaughter, she'll want some ribs. She goes, "Grandpa, can we have some ribs?" I said, "Where do you want to go?" She's got chilies. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good place now. <laughs> uh, but she she's a barbecue eater, and we just had some ribs the other night from Costco. <laughs> she mm -hmm. didn't care; it was just ribs. Yeah. <laughs> Now, some of my top, you just got my mind going. Now I got to try this Mexican place because I'm a big Mexican fan. But I did say Char, Stony River, Houston's, Moondance, Capitol Grill. See, if y'all give me these, this question beforehand, I would have had all those on my list too. <laughs> we cheated, I'm not, huh? I'm not trying to cheat the restaurants out of their <laughs> due status because they are good. I'm just... Yeah, I definitely understand because I be sitting here like, okay, so what can I say? What can this one? This one is good, but it's so many great restaurants. Just like you said, sometimes you might not even know the name, especially if you're out of town and you just happen to walk in on some and be like, okay, I think I'll eat here. So like I said, I love to eat. I would say mine's is um, Stony River, uh, Capitol Grill. Um, the, um, uh, Roof Crisp, um, and then I like Owen Brennan's mm. and, um, oof. I like, um, I can't remember the name that alluded me, but it's a, it's, it's a black owned restaurant that's across from the, um, Public Library off Poplar. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name. It's in a little. It's you got to go inside of this little it's shop. Right behind La Baquette. La Baquette is the bakery. Yeah. And you walk down the hall. Yeah. And it's back on the right. I know exactly what. You're talking I just about. can't think of the name of it right now. It'll probably come to me after we get done here. But I like going there because uh, the ambiance, the food is good. Um, yeah. So those are top five places. So now that we've done that, we've come to our segment where we give advice to those who write in to our email, which is at the cap podcast three at gmail.com. But folks send in questions uh, to both myself and Erica, since we are certified life coaches uh, and we just, just give, give advice to folks who, you know, who want to know, things and scenarios and situations that happen in life. So today the banana peel um, wrote in to us, a brother uh, he said, I pride myself on being a successful and ambitious guy. I played a stint in the NFL from 2015 to 2018 with a few NFL teams. The little money I made, I invested in various business ventures. Needless to say, I um, 
made some money but lost some lost much more i realized who was in my corner and not in re- and, and in regards to family and friends after a bout with depression i'm now bouncing back financially and personally the same ones who abandoned me are now trying to come back uh, around would i be wrong to cut them off and this is michael from new orleans louisiana uh, Eric, I'm going to let you give your take, and then I will give my take, and then we'll ask our guests to chime in. Okay. Well, hi, Michael from New Orleans. So um, hmm. I have been in those situations where you have people who um, don't seem to, like, uh, you know, build you up, who don't want to be around, but as soon as things start to heat up, you know, you're able to see them uh, coming, have them coming back around. And I wouldn't say that you would be wrong to cut them off, but um, what I tend to do, some of them, yes, I do cut them off. And some of them, most of them, as I grow older, I'm learning to not worry about what the people uh have thought of me in the past or even worry about what they're thinking of me right now. I'm trying to learn to be who I am and be who I'm supposed to be. It's really hard for me to cut someone off. And when I do, there's just nothing else that you can do. You know, they say fool you once, shame on, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I would say you have to use the better judgment. If it's going to be a hindrance to your growth and where you're going, by all means, you may need to cut tides. But if it's not a hindrance, keep growing. You never know how those watching you may still learn from their mistakes. And when they come back around, it's not going to just be just because they want a handout, but it's going to be to say to you, you know what, you showed me the error of my ways. So, Michael, you're going to have to be the judge of that, but keep that in mind. Um, That's some good advice, Erica. What I would tell you, Michael, is this. um, We have to hold people accountable, just like we have to hold ourselves accountable for things. Um, You know, I, I totally understand that. I've been different times in my life where, when it got, the tough got going, I saw who got gone. And then when it flipped around, I saw who came back around, and I'm like, and my me being in my flesh, even though I'm a spiritual guy, was like, oh, you, you keep it moving. Um, but I would say this, it, it really depends on whomever it is, and if they realize and took accountability for, you know, you know leaving you at a time uh, when you was, when it was low, um, but if they seem like it's you know it's they don't want to take accountability for that then you have to make that decision to you know sometimes you know you might have to cut them off if it's going if it's not going to if it's going to be detrimental to your peace and sometimes you have to deal or love them from a distance depending on who it is and what the circumstance was so it's natural to feel like that but um you know you just got to keep focus on where you are now and and the beauty of God allowing you to bounce back and you realizing that because depression is nothing to play with. Right. A lot of people have dealt with b- bouts of depression and sometimes they even realize they were depressed. Um, but you will be able to distinguish if you seek God first on who you may need to cut off and who you may need to just deal with from a distance. Uh, I would just say, you know, definitely, you know, me just leaning into my spirituality is that's how I try to decipher. Because if I just do it strictly from being carnal, I'm I'm throwing them deuces up, like you know. <laughs> so you know you don't you want to operate from that standpoint. So right. um, we're yes, gonna Simon. yeah we're gonna ask our guests. What would you say, Coach Hollins? So, well, it seems like we've been on similar journeys. You know, coming up. You know, not getting a lot of support and then making it to the NBA, and then everybody want to tell you what they did for you. (laughs) But I don't even have a problem with that. What I have a problem is when people 
try to use you. Mm -hmm. They ask you for something every week. Can you pay my house note? Can you pay my car note? Can you pay for my son's doctor bill? And you try to, and you want to help. And I think that we have to show mercy. And uh, because we've been shown mercy because we're not perfect. And I think you give people a chance uh, to do right, be right, show right, however you want to say it. But I think that at some point, as you just said, love them from a distance. Uh, I have a lot of family members that I didn't try to love from a distance, but when I held them accountable for what they were trying to do, they disappear. So you don't have to throw them away. They'll throw themselves away because they'll be mm -hmm. so angry at you for telling them what you already knew when you, they came to you. Can you loan me some money? You say, yeah. You say it three times. You say it four times. Then the fifth time, you're like, man, I can't do it. Oh, you forgot about the little people? No, but I have mm -hmm. not forgotten that you said you were going to pay me back four, more, four times before. And now you're mm -hmm. asking me the fifth time. So uh, what am I supposed to do? And as I've gotten even more into God, I think about, you know, I'm not your blessing. I may be prompted to bless you once, but you can't keep coming to me and circumventing God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> because he's not telling me to bless you every time. He's telling you, I bless you so that you could see that his blessing came from me and your future blessings will come from me. And, and when you, and I, you know, and that's how you have to deal with it. But, you know, you do it all in love. And like you said, uh, you know, praying about it is a huge thing and setting parameters. And when you set parameters, people that don't care about you and only want to use you will disappear. Exactly. Well, Mike, Michael, we hope that helps you out, man, down there in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, you just got some great advice from uh, myself, Erica, and our esteemed guest here, Coach H Hollins. So uh, definitely, man, take that in consideration and uh, be blessed on your journey, brother. So now we're, uh, this, we've are we had a great show, Coach Hollins. Absolutely. Th this is the time of the show that we allow our guests to let everybody know uh, any of their social media handles or any events they got going on, uh, um, any of that that you can let our viewers uh, and subscribers know. So have at it. Uh, I, I, that's a thing, you know, I'm on Twitter, <laughs> I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, but I don't even know the passwords for all that stuff because my daughter is the one that set it up. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I will mention, you know, to all you young athletes out there that your parents or somebody that coaches you are listening that I do have a website, I train fundamentals.com and I sell a, a little apparatus that will help you, uh, grow uh, from a footwork perspective in basketball and uh, uh, you know check it out and see if you like it see if you need it but uh, as far as I'm concerned I'm easy to get in touch with you know uh, I have people that I haven't played in at least 40 years maybe more that still write to my personal address and want me to sign cards and pictures. How they got that address, I have no idea. That's why I say it must be pretty easy to, to know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard that first to all our listeners, guests, and viewers. If you have a young man or young daughter who's a basketball player, um, he gave the um, his website for that apparatus for footwork. Definitely go on there, um, you know, and they can help them with their basketball journey. Uh, from high school into college and even maybe beyond. Um, so now we're here for the detour moment with Erica. Detour. Detour two. Detour two. Yes, it is the detour moment. Um, before I begin, let me let you guys know if you ever need a coach or a motivational speaker, you can book me at www.eph, the number six productions.com. You can also email me at Ephesians 6 Pro 
at gmail.com. And you can find me on Facebook as Eric Jackson and E6 Coaching and Consulting, as well as Cap Podcast and Ephesians 6 Productions. And you can also find me on Instagram um, as EJizzle40 and Ephesians 6 Productions, E6 Coaching and Consulting, and Cap Podcast. So it'd be great to hear from you. Today's um, Detroit moment is short. Um, it's okay to encourage yourself in your detours. Let me say that again. It's okay to encourage yourself in your detour. I have met so many people, especially here of late. There is like so, so much going on. There are people who are sick. There are people who are losing loved ones. There are people who are losing jobs. It is just so much. People are being depressed and it's kind of hard when you're in those states to Pick yourself back up again. Find the things that will give you joy and let that joy be inside of you. Give yourself a pep talk. Um, Stand in front of a mirror sometimes and say, I am going to make it. I will reach destiny. But say these things to you periodically. Get the negative thoughts out your mind and keep on moving from detours to destiny. Okay, that was some great advice there from Erica. The brain drop moment for the day. And the brain drop moment today is rock bottom will teach you lessons that mountaintops can't. I'm going to say that again. Rock bottom will teach you lessons that the mountaintop can't. Uh, We all in this life will experience ups and downs. That's a given. Uh, Regardless of your nationality, your uh, gender, or your religious belief or uh, void thereof you're going to experience different circumstances but when you're at in a season where you have hit rock bottom which i've experienced that before i'm sure you have there's a tendency uh to you know want to kind of throw in the towel sometimes when it just seems like it's one thing after the next after the next but what you got to realize is that during that time you're learning a lot that's building your resiliency uh, that's building your ability to persist. Um, if you trust in God and you believe that in yourself that you have that within you to rise to the occasion, and when you're at the bottom or you're in the valley, you, the only way to look is up. So that experience within itself will build you to the point that when you are achieving the goals you desire or when you have been blessed to be uh, on the on the part of the journey where you've been hoping and praying for, you will you will be grateful. You won't get arrogant. You won't forget that experience when you was at the bottom because as sure as you get to the top, you know, like the law of gravity, what goes up must come down. Uh, so always keep that in mind. Also, if you need a speaker, a, a coach, you can reach me at um, at my Linktree, Linktree forward slash Jerry Davis, Five Dimensions Coaching and Speaking. I would love to be your speaker at an event or on a, on a panel. Um, also on my social media handles on Facebook, Life Coach Jerry Davis, on Instagram, Life Coach Jerry Davis, um, and then here at the Cap Podcast. We do appreciate everyone who takes time out every episode to tune in um definitely keep doing that we'll keep bringing you great content we've had a blast today with our guest coach lionel hollins thank you for coming on the show today it is Um, absolutely amazing and we thank you so much for being thank you guys for having me definitely definitely and one thing as we're getting ready to close out that i leave you with every at go ahead i'm so sorry i just wanted to make sure that i remind you guys before we leave to hit that red button and subscribe, share, comment. We want to hear from you. Definitely. Definitely. I, I'm glad you remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like I leave you every, every time we get in here, uh, that are saying that I leave you with is if you're going to be anything, be for real. This is JD. And this is Erica. Until next time, let's cultivate. Accumulate. And we all will prosper. Goodbye. Bye-bye.